thank you very much for the introduction and the kind invitation to talk on this conference. I can only follow up to my uh, uh, to Vincent that I feel very honored to give a talk here. It would be nice to be there in person, but it shouldn't happen this year. Um, then I wanted to please encourage you to ask questions because I noticed uh, this in this conference again uh, quite a bit that if one is a little bit unfamiliar with a, a subject, then sometimes one has troubles to follow the talks. And so please interrupt me if something is unclear. There's not something I have to cover. And then also that's perhaps a little bit uncommon. I would like to thank everyone who encouraged me to keep going with this project because last week I thought everything falls apart. So it is very much a work in progress. Nonetheless, um, I mean, some things work and I start there, uh, but first I mean, let me say what I want to talk about. So I really want to talk today about the Mojampere equation. And we will assume that U is a map from omega. Omega is a, sub, a convex subset of R2 and it maps into R. We have on the right-hand side a smooth function, smooth, smooth really uh, C infinity. I mean, one can relax it. Um, I'm pretty sure that C0 alpha should be sufficient. But now for this talk, I would like to stick with C infinity and we assume it's bounded from below. Um, for the talk, it would be not necessarily to assume all the time that you find, I mean, that you're strictly away from zero, yes, but not necessarily by a value. And it's kind of, in the last talk, we saw kind of curvature, um, negative curvature in this talk, we will kind of focus on the other side. So the positive curvature situation, and that is kind of um, hidden in this um, positive right hand side. So what I would like to do is I would like to start with the motivation and say how this equation is actually very much um, linked to convex integration. And then I would like to say where I am at the moment um, in just to present the result and then some ideas um, of the proof. Okay, so um, let me start with the isometric embeddings and I really want to focus at the moment on the case of S2 and I'm interested in isometric embeddings from S2 with some given metric so um, S2 with a given metric G and G should be as well for um, at the moment a smooth metric and we are interested in finding a map U uh, perhaps I shouldn't call it U because U was later um, one valued, now it should be three valued into R3, such that the pullback metric is this me given metric G. And it was actually shown by, um, I mean, I'll ask this question if you can find V um, such a V if G is sufficiently smooth and Nuremberg solved it then. And you find it for sure, which is a smooth version. Excuse, excuse me, sorry. Question. Yes. Could you write slightly larger? Yes, I will try. Uh, <laughs> um, I can as well kind of zoom in. Um, ah, might be that this way, then it's better. Is this better for you? Yes. Yes. Oh, yeah. Right. Way better. Okay. Um, so, so actually what we know from last time that Nash gives us a possibility actually con to construct one with C1 um, C10, which is Nash Kuiper. And this was step-by-step step improved to more regularity. And at the moment, I think the best we know is uh, C, at least to my knowledge, it's uh, Z115. And this is um, at the moment, I think, um, Delelis, um, Siklehidi, and Inaun. Uh, 
uh, sorry, wrong. This would be the local one. Now I messed up. So this is our only um, uh, Chao and Seklehi. Yes. Because it's a global situation. Um, so, but we know as well by at least integration formulas that we are quite rigid and there's only one which would be um, Herr Glotz. So there we are rigid, there's only one. Uh, so rigidity I wanted to write here, sorry. And here we have flexibility. which is allowing for a convex integration. And this Herr Glotz was able to prove it that you are rigid. Uh, I, I again forgot something that is important. We will always assume that um, the Gauss curvature is positive. So we are in the positive um, curvature situation. So then th there's a proof of Herr Glotz, which was using uh, integration formula, which is very nice and very short. Then there was actually a generalization by Peng Fei and Xi. Um, more recently, who showed that you can have such a um, integration formula actually even in space forms. And then this, um, this I mean, the, the um, isometric embedding will be unique. Or um, there was a proposal by Gromov in his paper um, to, or a survey paper, local and global geometry, uh, where he compares kind of the question of rigidity to uh, the Cauchy Riemann equations. And in my current understanding, it would be linked to uh, the Pfaff system, which then really that the um, in this setting, the gauss kodatsi equation becomes a little bit looking like um, the Cauchy-Riemann equations. And then he um, claims that you can prove a uh, Liouville type theorem for them and show by that one um, that the embedding must be unique. Sorry, uh, okay. a question. A yes. question. Is, is the claim that for any metric on the sphere with positive curvature, there yes. does exist? Uh, I mean, no, the, this, this was proven by Nuremberg. There is one nice one. I see. And then by Nash, we know that there are a lot of them. Yeah, the yeah, question no, is. The regular one, for the regular one, there's always a, 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 a C2. There's one. One, one regular one. Okay. Yes. Thanks. And so, so the, the huge question is kind of where, or one interesting question is where is here the threshold? So where do you jump from flexibility to rigidity? And I, at the moment, <laughs> was there a question? Yeah, well, what these people, I didn't understand. What is the name of the hair what, what did they prove? Who? All these people I know, Herr Glotz, what, what Herr Glotz, they prove that if you have a C2, a so C2. If, if U is uh, V is C2, then there's only one. The power of one. Yeah, I, but I thought it was known before. Or not before, before. has C4. Ah, C4, I see, okay. Yeah, that, right. There is a C4, a more PDE-based proof. I agree. Yes. Okay. So um, some comments I wanted to add to um, to the rigidity. And so there is at the moment actually one. I mean, at the end, Herr Glotz 
gives the end step. So what one needs is to jump from something that is only a little bit above um, differentiable to something that is C2. And this was proposed, I mean, this was done by Borisov. And then there is a nice version by um, Conti, um, Delelis, and Segleidi. And this was uh, 2012, where they kind of use the degree argument and then rely on the work of Pogorelov on bounded extrinsic curvature. Okay, so this was able to show that if um, V is in C1 alpha and alpha is bigger than two thirds, then V is actually C2 and then it's the unique one. Yeah. What is it? So um, the, the, the hard step is kind of jumping from this um, little bit different, little bit uh, not really C11 differentiability to something that gives you more differentiability to apply this nice integral formula. Okay, let's go to the local setting. Um, so here we do the same. We are interested now in the situation that V maps from only a domain, not the global one, to a three, and it comes with a metric, and we are interested in an isometric um, immersion. Again, it should have positive Gauss curvature, and you are interested when you're flexible and when you're rigid. And it turns out that um, the flexibility comes in the very same way as before by the nash kuiper method. And the situation does not change a lot, at least from the exponents. We, it is known at the more moment up to um, one over fifth. And this time it was uh, um, Delelis, Inoun, and Siklehidi in 2015. And in the, the problem is here on the side of the rigidity, a lot less is known. What you could hope for actually is that you apply rigidity from the so-called Dabu equation. And I will say something on that one um, soon. Which is the main kind of motivation for me to study the um, weak motion pair equation. Okay, so that is the situation. And again, the question is where is here the threshold? All right, so that's everything I wanted to say here. Now comments to the rigidity. And it is known that if B is now going from omega to R3 is isometric. And let's say, um, C uh, C two. Then, actually, for all vectors you you might choose in S two, you have that the function u defined as just a scalar product between your isometric embedding. And this vector satisfies a Mojan paired type equation, and which means that you take the determinant of the Hessian of this uh, function. So it's the Hessian with respect to the given metric on your disk. And that is equal to the Gauss curvature 
the determinant of G of your metric, and then it's one minus the gradient U squared. And here again, it's measured in the metric. And here is the uh, really the metric gradient of the function. So actually this is equivalent to um, solving this equation to being isometric. Um, if you add the assumption that the gradient of your function should be less than one. So actually it's equivalent solving this PDE, um, this fully nonlinear PDE that is equivalent to solving the isometric embedding. On the other hand, I mean, this is a, an equation of a Mojan pair type. So we know that the Mojan pair equation has some smoothing properties. So you could hope that this equation actually not only provides you with this possibility to jump from less regularity to more regularity to apply classical results in classical PDE techniques, um, but as well, it could give you something like rigidity. And this was, I mean, this is one reason why you're as well interested to understand this equation in a more, um, in a more flexible way, kind of to see this equation on a, um, in, in a distributional formulation. So in the, in the setting, in the case that this, you are, map v is actually the graph of a function so x um, perhaps x is not a good letter let me call it z for being in r2 and then your function u of z then this equation actually transforms to um, the classical uh, more classical more Jampier equation um, plus great, uh, I shouldn't call here a gradient because I mean, it's the now the Euclidean gradient, not the uh, uh, Libicivita connection. Perhaps I write it this way to the three halves is equal to Kg. So here it really becomes into um, a cla more classical modern pair equation. So in the setting of graphs. So this was the main motivation for me to start studying the weak form of this equation and to see if we can say something about it. And actually it turned out or it turns out that we can write this one in two dimension in a so-called very weak form, um, very weak form, which is now the very weak Mojan pair equation. Right, start this one on a new page. So what we want to see is we want to understand if we can make sense of this equation, even if we don't have two derivatives. And if you write down what the determinant of the Hessian is, then this is the same as two derivatives, uh, twice the first derivative multiplied with the second one. And then you have the mixed der derivative um, squared. And it can, turns out that you can kind of um, take some, I mean, regroup the derivatives and you can see that you can write this one as um, two derivatives of the first the function um, with a derivative only in the first direction squared 
then you do this um, on the function with uh, the second derivative and you have then twice a kind of more, more mixed term. This is only rewriting the equation and this operator now become, oops, this operator becomes even nicer to write in a form of the so-called curl curl operator. And now you see this equation makes sense in a distributional form, even if the function is only C1. And by a paper by um, Patsa uh, and Levitschka, they showed that you can even do with this equation um, convex integration with the same threshold, I mean, flexibility rates that are, um, I mean, I think they did something like one over seven, then it was improved by Chao and Siglahidi to an exponent, again, one over fifth. So this now tells me that instead of only looking at this equation from the point of view of isometric embedding, it is as well interesting to look at it in, in this formulation. So this is where we now, where I kind of started with. I started in the form that I would like to have a solution of the form curl, curl of gradient u, gradient u is equal to f in the sense of distribution, meaning that I have that one half of the integration by parts over my domain omega, gradient u tends or gradient u, and I take um, the scalar product with the rotated gradient of any test function psi, uh, I wanted to call it phi, and this should be the same as phi f times phi for all test functions in my domain. So this makes sense if u is only in C1. All right. So um, on the other hand, if we now assume in the setting that everything is smooth, then we know that this um, differential operator on the left-hand side is nothing else than the determinant. So, but then I know as well from kind of the, core, um, the area formula or topology that if I integrate over the determinant of something, it is linked to the degree. So if let's say U is smooth or in this set of in C2, then I have as well that if I integrate um, the determinant d squared u against a function now where I plug in itself the gradient of u, then this is the same as if I integrate over the full image of the degree of my function of the of the gradient over my domain y and I have now a test function that depends on y dy. All right. So this looks very much this formulation here, if I replace now my formulation above that I want to have that I solve the Mont-Ampere equation by my solution on the right hand side. I get um, that I would like to plug into the equation here a test function phi that is um, okay here I was kind of yeah a, a test function phi that is itself um, a composition of something with my gradient. And now it, the question is kind of when this equation implies that I can see it in the formulation of that one. And 
let me call the distributional equation here one and the equation by con um, seeing as, as an equation on the degree two, then it was actually done um, already before that um, two implies three. If um, U is in C1 alpha for omega and alpha is bigger than two thirds. What is three? Uh, uh, sorry, one, two. <laughs> in my ah. notes, it was in my notes, it was, uh, <laughs> but I somehow missed somewhere a one. Okay. No, no. Okay. Um, and this step actually was already done in the work of um, Conti, Delalis, and Zwicklehidi in, in the setting of the isometric embeddings, but you can apply the same strategy and it can kind of as well be improved or uh, used now from the commutator estimates of Shikora who did this on the level of base of spaces. So, um, but nonetheless, I, this is now the starting point where I kind of wanted to start all my investigation. I wanted to start kind of with that at least I have this formulation of my problem. And that's the reason why I call it uh, the Mojampere equation from a topological point of view. So we assume um, you, in this moment, I mean, if you only assume that this one holds, then you could actually go backwards to um, gradient U only in C0, uh, C1. But um, so the first part of my result actually applies in that setting. But the second part again uses heavily um, the Hölder exponent. So therefore I want to stick with C1 alpha of omega. Um, satisfies that I have that the degree of the gradient of U for any compact subdomain of um, omega, if I integrate it against the test function, then this should be equal to um, F of phi gradient U. Um, on I integrate it over U for all U that are compactly supported in omega with C1 boundary. Why can't I? Ah, okay, I'm at the bottom of my page. All right, so let me perhaps copy it and put it. on my net next page. So this is now how I want to understand the Mont Ampere equation. And actually the inspiration for my work is, um, and how I wanted to attack this problem um, to show that actually such a solution must agree with the nice solution. I mean, a C2 solution, what you expect from the regularity of Mont Ampere um, is the work of um, Vladimir Zverk. And on the regularity, for the Mont Ampere equation. Without convexity assumption. The main difference is that he works in the setting that um, U is actually in W22. So it has a well-defined second derivative, which makes a lot, I mean, all the techniques he applies like Lebesgue points cannot be used in that situation because you just don't have a second derivative. 
But nonetheless, I think the starting point of his work um, was actually a theorem by, um, or a, more a paper by John Ball. And this one I actually want to um, quote because I think then you will immediately see what my starting point or my idea was to find out that my function u must agree with the convex function. The following are equivalent. So u is strictly convex. which would um, put us in the setting that it is the Mont-Jean-Pierre equation, um, the, the Alexandrov solution, so the classical solution to the Mont-Jean-Pierre equation. And that you have two things. So the gradient is locally a one-to-one -one map. And the second thing you would need to check is there exists one point where you have a local supporting hyperpoint. Um, So now on that side, you see that I am kind of in the situation for where topology comes into play because I want to have that the map is one-to-one, -one, which I can as well see on the degree of my map. And then there's this a little bit nasty assumption that you find one point where you can start with. And this makes the difference if you work um, globally actually or locally because if you work global, then it's clear that you can find a good point where to start with. And actually this one-to-one -one, um, property is as well kind of easier to achieve um, in the global situation than in the local, which makes a lot of uh, different difference. So now finally, I am able to tell you what um, my current result is. And this is, we assume that u is in C um, one alpha as before, um, omega subsec R2. Actually for that, it's not even um, necessary that it's convex. Here's solution of the Mont-Jean-Pair equation, um, but in, the, in this formulation, so in, in the setting of the degree, we know now this would be actually equivalent to solve it um, in the very weak form. Oh, sorry, this was on, on, the, on the page before. So it would be sufficient to have, uh, where was it? Here. So the, a solution of this equation, if we know that the function is um, C1 alpha and alpha is bigger than two thirds, um, then there exists a singular set, which is closed such that U or minus U agrees locally with the Alexandrov solution. Of um, our equation, it was one. And two additional properties. So if um, for alpha is only bigger than two thirds, then we know that the Hausdorff measure of this singular set um, is less than 
in, than infinity for some um, dimensional parameter, which is uh, four minus two alpha minus one over two alpha. And at the moment, I only know it's not there if alpha is bigger than one half plus one over two over square root of three. Then S is empty. So then actually on the full set, it agrees with um, the classical Alexandrov solution. Um, yes, it's, uh, th this exponent here looks my, like, a bit weird. Um, I don't think that it's optimal. Um, I actually guess one can push it down a lot, but uh, I was not able to confirm all my calculations I did. So now I would like to give you uh, some ideas how um, um, or let's say more a sketch of the proof. So the first part, which is kind of um, what I already pointed out before is that I would like to use the apply the um, theorem of John Ball. So there's one thing that you need to localize and to find sets where you're kind of locally one to one. And but even harder, you need to find at least one point inside the set where you have a supporting hyperplane. And this is where I wanted to uh, apply. May yes. I ask you a question? Yes. So when you're saying there must be a supporting hyperplane. Is it only that you want it locally, this supporting hyperplane? Yes. Like, you know, yes. So you don't want it all that, that it's no. like, you know. No, no, okay. I mean, one point, and you, if you find a neighborhood around this point, such that in that very tiny neighborhood, you're um, kind of, you have a supporting hyperplane, Mm -hmm. at one point then this propagates okay yeah that's what i was imagining yes this is kind of what john ball's um paper is telling you but it's i mean it follows kind of by the one-to-one -one property and what you do is okay you're at, at this one tiny point you're kind of lifting away immediately and then you start kind of just using um, this, I mean, touching hyperplanes from below. And you know, they must touch because you lift it off. And you can only touch in one point. I, I mean, at this point where you touch, it's the supporting hyperplane. But you know as well from the topological assumption that you can hit the gradient only once. So it must be the point where you attain the, the gradient. And this is telling you that in this small region, you were convex. Mm -hmm. And then this kind of propagates by open closeness. I mean, this is more or less the idea. But what I want, I mean, um, the idea is that to find this supporting hyperplane, I actually want to use topology. Uh, topology. Um, to show that um, B holds in many points. And which I call um, the Moore's Lemma. And the second step is then I mean, this is really no, I mean, this is a pure um, topological argument. There's no kind of re classical analysis. Um, not classic is now the wrong word, I don't know. Um, kind of hard um, PDE methods involved. And the second part is an analysis 
of the singular set. And here, the main ingredients are um, the higher integrability of the degree. which was actually already pointed out by uh, um, Delelis Inown. Okay, it needs some modification if, if you want to pu start pushing um, the number. I mean, this number where I'm absolutely certain about uses only their result, but if you want to go higher up, um, you you need to um, improve there. Um, then, okay, now I write here on the left um, because I would like to keep it on this page. Then you need um, classical regularity um, results for the Montjampier equation. In particular, you need that um, the main thing here is um, that you need to show that it this set doesn't contain flat faces or flat pieces. You need to show that this set is kind of this bad set is curved a lot. And then you use um, topology and co area co area formula on metric spaces. Okay. Um, and this actually then gives you a kind of, there you can then play two things against each other. The higher integrability is telling you that the set cannot be too large, which is kind of this first bound I was showing you. And then the topology and the regularity results for the Montjampier equation are telling you this set must, must be quite large. And so you have a lower bound on the size of the set and an upper bound, and if they don't match, it cannot be there. All right, I, I think I still have um, 10 minutes, correct? Yes. Okay, then I would like you, um, I would like to, I mean, if, if there are no questions, <laughs> I would like to give you an idea of this Morse lemma because I think I can give you a complete proof in picture. Uh, I, I just have a very quick question. So what do you yes. mean by yes. improving the higher integrability of the degree? Okay. Uh, you, can, you, you can get a better summability? Uh, yes and no. Um, is it okay if I postpone this after okay. the Morse lemma? Because I think um, sure. then it becomes clearer. Sure. I mean, because we have examples that actually show that they are sharp, but they are not great. Yes, 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 it's it's true. Okay. I mean, I'm, I'm not able to improve your result, but what you can do is you can use more information you got already, and then you need a little bit to rework your argument. Ah, okay, okay, okay. So you're using the equation. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I use already kind of the Morse lemma. So. Okay. Um, okay. So, so the lemma, the Morse lemma, is kind of um, the was more or less than the um, the starting point. So we assume we actually have only a C one um, C one function on the closed disk, and this is purely R two such that zero is the only um, critical point. Of you, Whoa. what happened? Um, of you in uh, the disk, then the following equivalence holds.
So zero is a local minimum slash maximum. This is equivalent to that the degree of the gradient map in the disk in that single point is actually bigger than zero. Actually, it's not only bigger than zero, it's one, which is not so surprising. And I mean, if you would now assume for a second that this function is actually C2 and uh, non-degenerate, it would be a non-degenerate critical point, then this is um, absolutely classical because um, if it's non-degenerate, then the I, I mean, you have two eigenvalues and either they are the same, then I mean, they must be of the same sign to have posit um, a positive degree, but this is telling you that you are a local minimum or a local maximum. And if they have opposite signs, then you don't, you have a settle point and a settle point is negative degree or degree zero, depending. I mean, degree zero, you wouldn't have because it's non-degenerate. Okay. Um, and I think I can give you, um, so, The idea to achieve this one is actually that you don't try to find kind of something like a regular point because a regular point is not defined because you don't have enough uh, differentiability. But what you actually do is you start looking at the level sets of the function u and try to see how this is linked to the degree. So, um, Let's assume this is a tiny neighborhood of the uh, zero. So we can assume that u is zero in zero. And the first step is actually that you show that instead of saying this is a local minimum and a local maximum, you can rephrase this one in being that zero is um, a connected component of um, u equal to zero. So this is mm, not very hard. Now you go, you want to show by contradiction that if zero is not a connected component, then actually the degree must be negative. And you can assume without loss of generality that your function is actually not C1, but it's C infinity outside this one point without changing anything of the assumptions. So you know that this levels, um, this set sigma zero is actually a smooth one dimensional manifold outside this bad point at the center. And you might look for a good radius where you in this, um, this radius intersect your smooth manifold sigma zero transversely. So you, you know there are only finitely many points. So uh, let's say two, three, four, uh, five, six. Let's put it like this. So these are the points where sigma zero intersects with um, the boundary. You know, it's kind of transversal. And now two things can happen here. I mean, you know, there are curves starting and either these curves are going up to the center or they need to connect two points at the boundary. Uh, now there's one missing. This, let's say here and here. And then, I mean, this sigma zero can, this is all sigma zero, pieces of sigma zero, but it, here it can be very wild. So can, you can have 
horrible many components and these all belong to that connected component that we call let's say gamma zero which is this one connected component that co of the um, of the zero set so the connected component i wanted to put it here so this one should be gamma zero all right so still you have a problem because you you hit always this point in this in the center and there you kind of have no information how to differentiate and now what you can do instead is you're not looking at um, gamma zero but you you would like to look at kind of where u takes the value beta and beta is very very close to to zero so u equal to beta and u equal to minus beta and now you can show kind of okay very close to each point where you intersect before there must be another point where the function takes the value beta because it was um, intersecting your your circle at the boundary transversal so there starts again a curve and this curve kind of you can show must link to one of the other points and it must link to a point to come close to another point which was linked previously towards the center so you do this around this gives you perhaps a weird object and now you look at this region here that you that you just enclosed and now by classical topology it's telling you because you your gradient needs always i mean look either outwards or inwards so in here let's say here is u is positive or b, bigger than beta then here it would become less than beta then here again bigger than beta and here less than beta uh so no wait here it was less and somewhere i messed something up yeah so bigger smaller bigger hmm. you have too many intersections yeah somewhere i have you have, you have an odd number of intersections i guess that's... yeah i that's that's uh yeah <laughs> I thought I, I kept attention to that because this is once that you need to prove, right? That it's an even yeah. number. Now it looks better. Yeah, now it's better. <laughs> okay. And now you can, instead of trying to calculate the degree of these pieces, you calculate the degree of the outline pieces here. Because now they start matching up. I mean, this one here, to, to get the um, um, how the tangent kind of um, rotates on here, you can actually calculate to the angle that is kind of curved around the center. And then this kind of this analysis of these pieces actually gives you precisely that if you, as soon as you see a picture like that, the, the degree is negative. And now having proven this lemma, you can go back to the, um, your formulation of your equation and you know that if you have it in this form, the degree is actually point-wise positive, strictly positive. And this is now telling you that whenever you have a well-defined point-wise degree, you're precisely in the situation of John Ball. So you find a neighborhood where you are actually one-to-one um, -one and you have now by the Morse lemma, um, a local minimum or a maximum, which is then telling you this must be a point where you have a supporting hyperplane. And in this supporting hyperplane is now kind of propagating up to the point where you see where you don't have a point-wise defined degree. Yes, and I think I'm out of more or less out of time. So the next step is then
to show that um, the set E, where you don't have a neighborhood um, or the singular set, actually, I called it S, is um, the, op um, the complement of U and U is the set of all point X such that um, um, you, sorry, U is locally, uh, is convex slash concave in the neighborhood of X. Now, you know that this bad set must be inside a subset of the map of the boundary. Because in all other points, you have a well-defined degree. And now you need to show that, uh, sorry, the pre-image of it. This is the main problem. Otherwise, it would be simpler. So it's the pre-image of the image of the gradients of the boundary. And then you need to show that this set cannot be large. And now I can kind of say something to um, Camillo's question, um, how I meant to improve their higher integrability. So what you can now say is, okay, I have um, my disk. So the large disk, it's not the disk of the Mohs lemma, but it's still inside the disk. And now you have somewhere there your large set, uh, your singular set that might be very fractal. You have no idea how it looks like. Let's say this is S. And what you now do is you actually slice. You, you look for a new boundary. And now you still know by the a first analysis of the singular set that all the points where your bad set hits the boundary, the boundary must kind of contain the information um, of the images of the gradient. So you can use that on that slice, actually your, your trace of the function here is better because you are a solution of the classical Morgan pair equation. And this kind of helps you to, um, because, because I mean, your function then is not only C1 um, one on the bound or C1 one alpha on the boundary, but it's C1 one alpha everywhere. And on the complement of an perhaps nasty fractal set, it's actually C2. Mm -hmm. Yes, and um, this is where I am at the moment, and I'm trying to really show that this um, singular set is actually not there. And I think it's time for me to stop. Thank you. Uh, Jonas, why aren't you formulating anything below two thirds? I mean, it seems to me that um, even just when you are above one half, you can't you can't map the boundary on the whole uh, on the whole set, right? So at, at least you must have some points where you have convexity, concavity, even though you you can't say that uh, the, the singular set is uh, is small. Um... Yes and no. I'm, I'm, the first problem is to apply my Morse lemma, you need something like to have a pointwise degree, well defined degree. And I mean, kind of the, the, the really nasty thing is that you need kind of to, to be able to isolate um, the critical points. So you need to show that there are points where the gradient has only finitely many pre images. Ah, okay. Which kind of needs that instead of writing here the degree, you would like to replace this one by the number of pre-images. Uh -huh. 
And this I only know how to do um, if um, if you're um, two thirds. On the other hand, I mean, this is again, not, not the full truth. The full truth is this theorem, at least the first part applies as soon as you have, um, if you read your equation, where is it? In that, I mean, oh, it was on the, the, this page. I mean, if you assume you have this formulation, and you assume your function is C1, then actually you know you're, you're on a large set, you are actually, um, and okay, I don't know, you have fine points. On an open set, you agree with the Alexandrov solution. But to get any estimate on the size of the single set, I would need that the, degree is higher integrable, then I agree with you that actually this one should hold for any alpha bigger than one half. I mean, so the first part agrees with um, every alpha bigger than one half. So correct. As soon as you assume that three holds. Okay. Mm -hmm. But I'm confused. So you assume that three holds with the number of counter images or, or, or with the degree? No, no. I mean, if you have this formulation, then you get this one. Ah, okay. So that, that's all I that's all I meant. I mean, if you have that formulation, you should be able yes. to do it. Yeah, yeah, sure. I mean, this I'm is the first that. step. <laughs> I misunderstood you, sorry. Okay, so thank you very much, Jonas.